Hey everyone, and welcome to the SaaS developer community where we learn from each other about new SaaS technologies. And with me today, I have Santona Tuli. Uh, Shantona, sorry. <laughs> and I met Shantona at Data Day Texas, really cool conference last uh, week. And she presented on unifying batch and stream processing, which is when I heard that she's talking about it, I was jumping up and down because my favorite topic, I invited her over. When I did the research on her background, so I can properly introduce her, I discovered that she's actually quite famous for appearing in a movie about physicists uncovering the secrets of the universe. And it turned out that when she was in UC Davis, she did research around the ways to uncover what actually happened in the Big Bang. So she made this transition from researching the Big Bang, actual science, into data science, and now into data flows, uh, batch, and streaming. Thank you so much for being here with us, Shantona. Hi, Gwen. I am so honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Let me jump right in. We were talking about unifying batch and streaming. Now, almost all of us have batch processing and you were doing mostly batch processing in the past as well. And now a lot of us want to add stream processing and for the last few years, everyone has been in the process of adding stream processing. Why do we need to also unify them? Why can't I just have my old batch processes, some new stream processing and call it a day? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think the, the biggest motivator uh, for me personally and, and sort of the way we see it at Upsolver is that it's a struggle to have two completely different infrastructures and have to you know, it's a, as a developer, right? Uh, it's, it's your, if you're used to batch, batch processes, you have your batch infrastructure, let's say it's Spark, um, you know, orchestrated with Airflow, et cetera. Um, and then you get one streaming data source because, you know, it's relevant to your analytics or it's relevant to your um, data product use case. And now you have to like switch the mindset completely. You have to do the research, figure out what the relevant technologies are um, in stream processing, and then incorporate that somehow um, into your infrastructure. So uh, for us, that's the main pain, po uh, pain point that we're trying to solve is uh, we would want, we, we would like to provide you a, a unified platform or a platform where you can, you don't necessarily have to think about whether your data is, uh, you know, coming in batches or whether it's coming sort of in a, in a stream, um, you can just write your data pipelines and we handle all the complexities, uh, the infrastructure um, for you. That's super interesting. So you're talking about streaming and batches, a property of the data source. And you're saying that why make the data source determine everything about your processing pipeline? Yes. Well, I kind of, I have to admit, even my thinking was that batch and stream processing are actually a property of the pipeline itself. So when people are writing those unified streams, do they need to do anything to make the specific flow more batchy or more streamy, or is this all automatic depending on the data source? Yeah, I, I think that... Uh... Primarily, the way that I've seen it and, and from talking to people, primarily it does get determined by your data source, right? Uh, you know, what what process you need to employ, uh, apply. So uh, let me let me dig a little bit deeper on that. I If I have a um, use case, if I, if I have a streaming data source, right? Let's say I have a, a Kafka topic um, that, that's bringing in data. Um, usually... Um, if I'm, especially if I'm used to doing analytics in a batch context, what I'll end up doing is sort of collecting from that stream and then make it sit somewhere and then do some batch processes on that, right? So that's, uh, I think, a lot of the current usage that we see. And that's uh, th that's why sort of the conversation has to start with data sources, because even at that level, at the source level, we have these different technologies that we have to um, you know account for. And then we're doing the unification, whether we like it or not, right? Whether we're doing it, you know, in a, in a 
proper uh, way or like sort of like duct taping solutions. Um, usually our data products are going to rely on multiple different data sources. Um, and some of them are going to be bad and some of them are going to be streaming. And uh, often for analytics, we don't need super real time uh, data or we haven't thus far, we haven't really been pressed to have analytics down to the minute, right? But I think that's changing. Like there's a shift in our industry um, and just, you know, technology is moving so fast, right? There is definitely, we're seeing more of a desire for fresh data and more near real time and even analytics and, you know, certainly other use cases where, you know, you have an ML service, for instance, you definitely need things to talk to each other a bit better. So, um, Yes, not, you know, don't want to ignore the processing part of screen processing, the transformations, uh, you know, trying to make them as live as possible is also important. But uh, in my experience, I've seen sort of uh, just even at the source, you know, you have two completely different um, types of data, two completely different technologies, and then you kind of make them gel somehow for your da downstream applications. And we want to take make that whole whole process more smooth. You said something that I really, really loved, which was that at the end of the day, what matters is your data product, what you're actually building, what you're trying to achieve. And if that data product requires both batch data and streaming data, you have to unify them at some point, no matter what platform, what solution, what you, like, you have no choice, essentially. Exactly. So I am curious to hear more about the kind of data products that people are building that really take those uh, two sources and really a bit of the requirements around them. You said that actually you, at first, maybe there wasn't that much need for real-time data in the data products, and this is actually shifting and you're seeing more of it. So I'm really curious to hear more. Yeah. Yeah. So the reason I say that is, uh, so I've done user research um, for for SaaS developers at a couple of different places now. And I think uh, the, the consistent takeaway is that most people are doing analytics, right? Most data um, science today is analytics to help answer business questions. And we're shifting towards more self-served uh, analytics. So it's data as a product, uh, as opposed to, you know, dashboards or, or something like that. Um, so sort of the, a much smaller section uh, are, are doing uh, machine learning or some other more uh, real-time application of data. So that's, that's the first thing. Um, the, I'm gonna pause here. Um, I, I think I, I went off on a tangent, so I want to get back to your your question exactly. Yeah, it um, wasn't much of a tangent. Um, I I think it is important to say that people are mostly doing analytics, and that it sounds like you're also saying that analytics is mostly not something you do in real time. It's something that a human explores the data, and therefore it's at human time, I would say. It's not about being batch or streaming. This is just that humans in the loop are, by virtue of being humans, are not quite real time. Um, so this is good to know. <laughs> but it does, I think it does help us. So I'm. this is maybe my background. Uh, like you, I'm a product manager. And in my mind, when you design a system, at first and foremost, you design it for the user. You have to know who is your user, what is the requirements, how does we want to do their job, what is our job, what is difficult about their job, and then you start building the system. So if you know, yes, and the, the results of all my data pipelines, there sits an analyst and they do their job in a certain way, it helps us build this pipeline. But you also mentioned earlier that the use cases are shifting and maybe even the user and persona are shifting and therefore our entire data products have to shift with them, including the way we process data. Yes, yes, exactly. So um, from, so, so two, two trends that we're seeing, right? One is that uh, analytics is uh, getting faster, right? So uh, let's, let's get a bit more concrete. Um, if my, so, so let's say I'm on a data team and uh, some of my consumers are the customer success team, right? So uh, one of the things perhaps that they're trying to answer is um, what is the likelihood that my, the client that, you know, this particular client is going to churn in the next week or something like that. Um, so, and, and that 
in order to answer that question, uh, they'd, they'd come to me and they'd ask, uh, you know, they would, would work together to build whatever metrics and uh, whatever metrics are relevant to answering that question. And we would agree on a uh, deliverable. So if that deliverable is a dashboard, let's, you know, sticking with the, with the, uh, simplest one. It's a dashboard where, um, you know, they're, they're seeing, you know, maybe their usage, the client's usage, et cetera, um, and whatever other factors we decide is, is important. Now, previous, I think that, you know, we're used to, um, I, I said that the SL, or maybe, maybe they're interested in answering that question at a weekly cadence, right? They want to see, okay, how stable is their usage this week um, compared to last week? Are we seeing like a downward trend or an upward trend and so on and so forth? Um, so in that case, perhaps my dashboard um, doesn't have to incorporate data, you know, from two hours ago. Maybe it's sufficient to look at the client usage today. And then, you know, every day you sort of have this uh, data point for, for every day, uh, what their usage is, and then you can do your weekly aggregate and so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a, that's a typical use case. And I think it, it makes sense to have um, perhaps a daily batch feeding into such a dashboard, um, because your decision time frame is longer. Um, but I think that increasingly, um, things are actually moving a lot faster. So we're, we're kind of getting uh, data a lot faster too, right? So uh, our client is, is in our product, um, is, you know, very, doing various things in the product. And I have, I have the instrumentation to collect the data on what they're doing at this given moment. Why should I wait a week to make a decision around them? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to, I want, you know, and, and, you know, the, the human aspect is extremely important as well. If I, if this dashboard was to update every minute or, you know, every second based on, you know, what my client was doing on, on the, on, on their platform, on my, on my platform, that would be crazy, right? No one would actually get any value out of it. My uh, customer success partner would look at the dashboard and it's jumping all around and it doesn't mean anything. So certainly, you know, we don't want to just say that every process needs to go you know, as fast as possible and, you know, in as real time as possible. But on the other hand, I think that we are uh, getting to a point where we want to make decisions in a timely fashion. Uh, and that, again, that doesn't mean super absolute real time. It doesn't mean as close to real time as possible, but it, it's a balance. It's a trade of a uh, trade off between um, what's, what's a reasonable, um, Time frame to make my decisions on, and what the relevant you know data data windows are that I need, and also um, something that I can consume and digest, and you know maybe discuss with my team and act on. Yeah, and I want to mention the use case. I'm sure you ran into it as well. You ship something new. Maybe it's a new blog to your website. Maybe it's a new feature to your product. You make some announcement, and then you sit and refresh the dashboard. <laughs> every five seconds, not even every minute. And because you want to say, are people, use, see, are people using it? Are people clicking? Am I getting any traffic? Is it going up? Is it kind of just a trickle? Uh, so even though I don't need the data in real time, and the decision on whether the blog or feature were successful will probably only be made months away or weeks away, I really want the data in real time. It's not right. a need, but it's a very strong want. I would yeah. say. So yeah, 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 certainly. Yeah, yeah, I've definitely seen that as well. It's it's not always about how is this data going to let me make a decision. It's also about getting, you know, we're we're everything's moving faster now. We're scrolling on our all our social media, right? We want to know. We uh, are immediately immediate gratification generation. There's just yeah. nothing <laughs> to be done about it. But you and, also and mentioned to me, sorry. Yeah. Uh, just, and there's something something to be said for that. Um, I'll just say uh, briefly because I mean, the faster you can react, the better it is, right? So if you do see that you know you launched something yesterday and you're sort of tracking it, um, it you know today or Im immediately, um, maybe you don't want to make any big decisions. Like you certainly don't want to roll back based on like one day of data, but also you know having that visibility and observability into how your product is actually doing in real time, I think that is actually very powerful. I agree. Although sometimes it's actually better not to react in real time. <laughs> oh, yeah. When we talked earlier, you also mentioned 
that some industries actually have to react in real time. So for example, the ad tech industry, they show ads and every ad could be a lot of money or it could be no money and just a waste of uh, real estate and bytes. And it has to be decided and adjusted by machines immediately. Uh, so can you tell us more about how the ad tech industry is using batch and streaming to show us the correct ads? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we, we talked about analytics use cases, and, and as we said, most use cases are analytics, but it is also extremely important to keep in mind that a lot of our services are dynamic, as, as you just uh, explained, right? So um, I'll, I'll dig deeper into ad tech, but another example of a, of a dynamic uh, website that folks are interacting with is, uh, for example, e-commerce uh, websites, right, where you have recommendations en engines that are uh, serving uh, you items that it thinks that you're interested in and it wants to react immediately based on how you're actually behaving. So these are all um, sort of similar use cases, but in, you know, sort of different industries and, you know, different domain spaces. So um, certainly it's, it's uh, there's a lot of use cases. Um, so in ad tech specifically, right? Um, so what we're interested in doing is serving you an ad based on what we've learned about you and i say we i don't i don't work for an ad tech agency i'm just you know sort of talking from that perspective but um let's say you know i have information uh some information about you and i can make an educated guess as to something that that you're interested in and i want to serve up that ad um that obviously there is the one component that is i can only serve it to you when you get on a specific website so there's that um and then the, the second component is um after you've seen it what do you do, right? I want to capture the data around how you interact with it. Do you click on the call to action? Do you ignore it? Do you like hover over it and so on and so forth? So in, um, in, in real time, I want to be able to associate your behavior with that ad impression. So that, and, and that's a common challenge that we've seen with our customers and something that we believe, um, you know, Absolve versus SQL Lake is, is a very, uh, adept at solving. Um, so, so, so here you can imagine that the ad that you're serving um, is, is has been generated based on a model that has incorporated historical data, right? I'm not ca capturing all this information about you when you hopped onto this website. I have an entity that's associated with you that has your um, sort of historical behavior, um, and and then so that's sort of we can think of that of that as a batch process, right? Processing that data coming up with this, uh, uh, you know, ad generation. And then there is the streaming part of it, which is you coming onto the website and you potentially clicking on that data. And I need to, again, make that attribution. You might click on my ad immediately within seconds, like that's, that's, a, that's a common thing, but you might come back to it an hour later. Right. Or, you know, you're it's some you can't say ahead of time how folks are going to react. Right. And I still want to associate that action with the ad because that that is, you know, there is connective connectivity. There is temporal connection between the two things. Right. Uh, or contextual connection, rather. So the challenge then becomes in my pipeline is how do I process that information. How do I make that association? Um, so, for example, let's say I want to answer the, just the question of was this ad that I served Gwen at 10 a.m. successful or not, effective or not, right? So, for that that simple question, my pipeline has to sort of sit and wait to see, you know, if your reaction comes in. I can't just say, oh, I served it at, at 10 a.m. It's you know 10:05. Nothing's happened you know, it, it was, it was completely useless, right? So I have to put in this, uh, this thought, thought process, this logic, I have to build in this logic into my pipeline that says, okay, let's wait, let's wait and see if Gwen does react to it. Okay, but how long are we going to wait, right? Are we going to wait for perpetuity? Like when, you know, 10 years later, we're still holding on to that, that one ad that we served. So there, there are uh, decisions that uh, we have to make in, in pipelines that incorporate batch and streaming processes. And even when it's like two different uh, streaming data sources around how we want to um, associate mom events, right? Moments in time, uh, moment in time ev events and how we want to build analytics on top of that. That makes perfect sense. And it sounds like a lot of decisions are actually business decisions. Like how long do I want to wait? 
it's not really, the engineer may have input. Hey, if you want to wait more, we'll have to store more data. It will cost you that much more. But at the end of the day, the business has to say, we reward advertisers uh, if it's effective within, as you said, half an hour, an hour a day. Like how long do we actually continue counting things? So it, if you were to build a data uh, platform for that, you would probably make it adjustable and configurable easily as the business makes its decisions. You would avoid hard coding the batch size, the stream rate, all those things into your system, right? Right, right, exactly. And so uh, I mentioned the main pain point that we're, we're looking to solve at Absolver. The, the second, I think, core principle that we have is making it easy uh, for you to write the pipelines uh, for what they're meant to do and not around what they, you know, how that's achieved, right? So it's a declarative versus imperative parad paradigm. Um, so in this case, um, as an analytics engineer, you are just interested in saying, what was the effectiveness of this ad that I served? Um, was it successful or not based on, you know, and I, I'm going to define that that success um, as, uh, you know, within 30 minutes, right? So that that's a contract that that you're thinking about. And that's all that you should have to think about. You shouldn't have to think about, you know, is is this, am I, do I have a heartbeat that goes out every every couple of seconds to see if, you know, <laughs> Gwen has uh, inter interacted with it and so on and so forth. So uh, the way that you would write that pipeline in Absolver um, is you would uh, use a, uh, what we call a, I mean, we don't have to get into the technical details, uh, but you'd, you'd write a synchronized pipeline, right? Such that that association between the events is there. So the event of serving you the ad and you clicking on it. So that we're gonna look I for- I'm actually interested a bit in the technical details because earlier you mentioned declarative language and I was wondering like, does Absolver have its own language or can people write in Python and Scala the way they are used it's to? SQL. It's, oh, it's, it's all SQL. It's so all I basically SQL. kind of write my usual analytics function with window and partition by time and all that, yes. and do take care of everything. The yes. I don't even have to think batching, streaming, whatever. Exactly. Just write SQL. That's the way the world was meant to be, really. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is our value prop, and I agree with you. It's a strong value prop. No, it, it's a it's a challenging problem to solve, right? Un, under the hood, um, it's a challenging problem to solve, and we have uh, definitely we have some very uh, intelligent folks uh, working on this. Um, and uh, there are a few few different things that um, I think we have discovered through the years um, around how we can we can make this uh, possible. Um, one of those things is what I just talked about is pipeline synchronization. So data records, um, you know, we, we often have timestamps in, in our data tables and we're, we're used to that, right? Created that and so on and so forth. Um, at, uh, at Upsolver, within the SQL Lake uh, product of, of Upsolver, two timestamps are going to be um, very, very important. One is the event time and one is the commit time. Um, so the event time is when the data was actually generated <laughs> and um it's actually sql lake like the l uh, in the lake and the L sql goes together <laughs> Sorry about that, but yeah it's just the first time i'm hearing this term and there's obviously lakes everywhere these days lakes yeah. streams all of that so it just was uh, it's funny but also extremely memorable so i like it <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Sorry okay. for the distraction. You're talking no. about two types of symptoms. <laughs> yeah. So, so you know that that event time um, is is when the data was generated, and then the commit time is when it's written to the database, uh, or even more specifically, when it's written to a certain table, right? So, typically, um, most uh, jobs are what we would what we call. Un unsynchronized, like the way you would expect your database to handle um, sort of pipelines is you do processing based on when the data was committed to the database, right? So you're, you have, um, let's say, a dependency between table A and table B, um, then you have a process that you know, combines those two and does some sort of aggregation on it. And you uh, usually do the window of aggregation based on the, when the data was committed into those tables. Um, that's what we call an unsynced uh, pipeline. 
Yeah, because if you have multiple tables and things are written at the same time, you will not see the same data if you look at the same commit. So, yeah, exactly. very unsynchronized. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, like even before, even uh, within a, a process, right? So for example, if I have a data record um, and I do some transformation on it and feed, that feeds into table B, and then I do a different transformation on it and that uh, feeds into table C, right? Even for the same data record that is clearly in my database, one of these transformations can be much shorter than the other one. And then the data record is in table B, but not in table C yet. So if you have a process that aggregates from table B and C, you're, you know, you're just going to have that that data that is clearly in existence, but not uh, reflected in your aggregation. Concurrency is very hard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> concurrency is very hard. Yes. Um, so, so the the way that we're uh, we're sort of trying to solve this is, um, you can there's this sync keyword. It's as again coming back to it's simple SQL, right? So create sync job is what you would write um, with, and then say what your SQL um, query is, right? So select from table A, select from, and, and from table B, and then you do this join and so forth. Um, and then that job is going to actually uh, act on the event time window between those two tables. So rather than the commit time, uh, you are going to now say, okay, I'm going to process all of the data that is relevant to this event this event time window where the where the data was generated and now this pipeline is going to wait right you can also set the logic again we're going back to the business logic you can set that within this pipeline you can say this is uh, what is what is my definition of of late data what is a reasonable uh, time for me to wait to actually incorporate the data or you know sort of say that it's it's not relevant so that's um, that's how we deal with that and our general recommendation is that you should be writing you should be using sync pipelines um, as much as possible on your data because then you have that lineage um, of you know what happened to your data. Right. I'm going to pause here because you're you're agreeing and you know I don't want to just yeah. Up. No, I like that concept a lot, and I really like that in your system you separate and you give people the option to choose. Uh, because one thing we discovered, so you may know the history, Kafka streams uh, was started exactly the same way. We were thinking event time is the thing that matter and you want to persist event time throughout all your pipelines and this creates the most trustworthy data at the end. Uh, but we discovered that there are some use cases that actually need the commit time. One of them is if you, if all you do, if your pipeline is the most simple thing in the world and you just need to synchronize from one data center to the other, you actually want to synchronize things that were arrived to the first data center in a certain time window. So this is actually based on commit time. And it took yet another iteration in Apache Kafka to figure it out and to make this an option. So I'm glad that you guys are offering both things to- Right, the exactly. because use cases exist, right? There are use cases for you know complete synchronization, but there are use cases where you don't actually need the synchronization or you want the unsynchronization. So yes, absolutely. That's one of the things, uh, one of my favorite things about the platform as well is as the user, you can define whether you want it to be a sync job or an unsync job. Um, and within uh, the sync job, so there's the, I'm, I'm going to take a second to to say it the right way. Um, within sync jobs, you can also have, so for example, let's say I'm creating a new sync job, uh, but uh, part of my, uh, like the the stream that's, that's going to populate uh, the data for this pipeline, part of it has historical data, right? For example. So now you are, when, when the pipeline, when the commit time, of that data that's, let's say that historical data is from a few years ago, Th that that can happen, right? So now your um, the gap between your commit time and your event time for those events is really large, right? So now you also have to make decisions or how, how do I wanna deal with that? Do I want to sort of sit here and process all of that now? Do yeah. Do I care about the synchronization um, all the way back or going forward? So you, it, we also let the user make the choice around that. Like, do you want that time consistency uh, and synchronization going forward from this point? Or do you want to actually backfill and try to make sense of all the historical data as well? That's fantastic. And this connects with something that I saw and kind of ties stuff together. So New York Times, they have on, available online every 
uh, edition, every paper they shipped since 1888 or something when the paper got founded. Like they scanned all of it, made it searchable and available online. So for the search engine, they absolutely need to index all this old data. But as far as I know, they're not serving advertisements on the old data. <laughs> I've only ever seen advertisements on the new data. And now that I think about it, maybe they decided not to upload all this old information into their streaming platform because the event date is uh, 150 years in the past, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And that's the thing. You should be able to make that choice because you're the one who knows your data. We're not, you know, as a platform, we shouldn't be opinionated about, oh, this is, you know, how you have to handle it. You're all of a sudden, you're going to spin up right now all the compute that's needed to process all of your historical data and your whole stream is going to depend on that. Because maybe, you know, you want to be able to get value out of it today and right now. So, exactly. so I was curious as a product manager, and you sometimes use your own product. Now, I know you joined AppSolver fairly recently, so maybe you did not have a chance, but did you build any batch stream processing uh, yourself? Um, no, personally, I've been uh, playing with the product, but I've uh, mostly used the templates that we have. So um, if when you go into uh, SQL Lake, uh, our new product, you actually can, uh, you see a bunch of templates that you can sort of, get pieces from and, and write the pipelines that you need. Pretty common. Uh, but uh, they're really good at sort of demonstrating like, you know, one one thing at a time. Um, so I'm still at the at the point where I'm like combining things. But for example, um, you know, S3 to uh, Athena um, template is, is there. And it's, it's super um, useful for me to be able to like see each of those things in action. And we have sample data and, and so on and so forth. Um, the way that... I mean, I think part of what we mean when we say unifying batch and streaming is actually that um, unified infrastructure piece. So even when we are dealing with files in S3, we're actually treating that as a stream as well in that we're doing our operations row-wise. Mm -hmm. So um, it's Sure, it's you know your data lands in your S3 bucket in a batch, and then you want to do something um, with it. But our uh, unification is at the level where, um, great, your your um, data might come in at at, at this batch inter interval, um, but we're gonna process um, your your data. Let's say it's tabular data. We're gonna process it a row at a time, um, such that it, it's a stream even when it's not a stream. So I basically, when I write my queries, I don't have to care if the data arrives to S3 from Kafka, which would be more streamy, or if it's a daily dump from my data warehouse. Kind of exactly. That That's yeah. exactly right. That's really and, cool. I mean, that's not to say, like, we still, of course, have the context. So one of the one of the things with streaming um, sources is how long is the is the data retained in the queue? Right, um, and and most streaming sources will will drop data after after a certain time, uh, but because we use this sort of um, data lake on S three, we don't lose the historical just because we're processing it as a stream doesn't mean that we don't have the context. So if you do want to do aggregates um, that you know would incorporate you know maybe uh, that entire table or even other different tables that are living in different partitions, right? Um, we have a very rich way of cataloging the data, like we, and we have rich metadata, um, such that you can definitely do all of those aggregations as well. So just because we're processing it row-wise doesn't mean that we're limited to like, you know, five data records or something that, that you're gonna process on. Perfect. So you men we mentioned S3 like 15 times in the last uh, few minutes. So I did want to switch context a bit. Um, the company you work on now and also previous companies, it was basically data processing service. So people um, would not have to maybe run all of it themselves. And uh, it was basically come to our website and define things and we will take care of some part of the mess for you. So I really wanted to ask you for your insights. Uh, a lot of people that are watching this video are doing data processing as a service of some sort. Yeah. And you learned a lot while building two different products that do it. So I would love your insights around customer expectations when they try to 
use data processing as a service. Yes, no, that's a, that's a great, great topic and something that um, I'm, I'm very excited about and, and interested in uh, as well. So one of the things that, and that, the, the, pro, the thing is that it's all evolving, right? People are discovering what their needs are as we go and people are learning about various restrictions. We're getting new laws around, you know, GDPR compliance and et cetera. So it's an, it's an evolving landscape. So um, that, that's the first thing to acknowledge is that we're all learning and we're all learning together. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're seeing certainly is an increase in desire for owning your own data. Um, and I mean, this isn't super new because you've you've had on, you know, we used to have on-prem um, offerings as well and people sort of manage their own data and their own data centers and stuff. And then actually we, we moved to this more cloud um, framework where things are shared a bit more and there's more multi-tenancy and stuff. But now we're sort of having this, um, you know, folks are like, okay, but do I really want, um, you know, my, uh, the same, you know, even compute, do I want to share that with others? And there are various concerns, like what the, what is the pricing model? Am I, am I paying for someone else's compute? And, you know, all of these things, right? So, I think that partly it's education. We are learning more about how the internet works, how the cloud <laughs> uh, works, um, and and we're uh, sort of figuring out how we want to interact with it. Uh, but overall, I, I do think that we're seeing a shift um, towards again, um, uh, sort of owning my own data, um, having minimal um, instrumentation in there um, that will give the SaaS provider um, my data while at the same time enabling the SaaS provider to get, provide me the service um, that I'm looking for, right? And this is a, it's it's just something that is has to be a collaboration. It's something that has trade-offs. You know, we, we have to acknowledge that I can't really provide you a managed data service uh, that I'm going to take responsibility for like so much like uptime, you know, reliability and all of these things. And you're going to say it's, you know, I'm going to shut you out. I'm going <laughs> to shut you out from, from my system. Right. So, um, and unfortunately, we have a lot of tools, right? We have the the uh, Prometheuses and Thanos that will help us um, collect the data. We have data dogs and, you know, we have various ways of sort of like, uh, compartmentalizing it. Um, but it's important to acknowledge that it's an ongoing conversation. And I think some of the ideas that we have around data privacy are a bit misguided. Um, you know, we, we and, and you were saying this earlier um, as well, is that like, even when you're using S3, you're, you know, it's not like you have, you have a nice, neat little uh, hard drive that that's sitting somewhere physically, and then that's yours. So um, yeah, it's, it's an evolving landscape. Um, we are uh, trying, like, I think we as in the industry is trying to do things as correctly as possible. Um, and obviously, having uh retaining maintaining privacy and security are extremely important and i'm i'm seeing that products are evolving uh based on this evolving landscape as well so at, at my previous company you know we we started with an offering that was more uh managed so the data plane and control plane would live uh you know both with the with the managed service and then uh we decided we saw that this wasn't um going to work for everyone especially for folks that care more about you know, data security like banks and stuff. So, you know, then you have the separation of, okay, the VP, the customer VPC or data plane lives el elsewhere and the control plane sort of, you know, is, is where everything uh, comes together. And that has some uh, insight into what's going on. Um, and I mean, who knows what the next thing is going to be, <laughs> right? Uh, going forward, we might have to come up with some other um, innovation around in that space as well. I'll say for Upsolver, uh, we are a fully managed um uh, offering, but we uh, do any great with the customer uh, VPC. So we ask that um, in your AWS account, uh, you have an S3 bucket that's provisioned um, for Absolver use, SQL Lake use, um, and then you have uh, uh, AWS Glue service as well. That's what we're going to use for the data catalog. And Indeed, it stays in your AWS account, um, and we are uh, just, you know, sort of using using those assets in order to uh, let you write your pipelines the, the way you need to. You can go into those S3 buckets. This is something that we do. I think it's a bit different than some other SaaS offerings. Um, you totally can go into your S3 bucket and, you know, 
take out data if you want to put in. I mean, it's not recommended. It's going to break your pipelines. But at the end of the day, it's yours. Um, and and you can you can do all of those things. And we're not gonna say, oh, this is you know our this is our, our pipelines running on it, like all the logs that we generate, all the rich metadata that we have that sort of associates all the all the data in the lake. Because, you know, when you have data in a lake, you need to know what data is what and how, how they're interconnected, right? So all of that, we also store in S3 buckets in the same S, you know, in the same S3 area. So, you know, we don't do, we don't believe in lock-in. So if you want to, you know, switch, you can, like the, all, everything stays with you. Yeah, and I'm sure it gives your customer a lot of trust and confidence. And I hope they do not shoot themselves in the foot too frequently <laughs> by deleting one of those buckets that you actually really need. Yeah. <laughs> Santana, it's uh, been absolutely a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing what you learned. Thank you so much. Uh, the pleasure is all mine. The honor is mine. Just thank you so much for having me.